Good afternoon. Dear Mr. President, distinguished guests, colleagues, and friends, I am pleased to welcome you to the Hesburgh Lecture in Ethics and Public Policy. My name is Scott Appleby, and I have the privilege of serving as the Marilyn Keough Dean of the Donald R. Keough School of Global Affairs. The Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies established the Hesburgh Lectures in 1995 in honor of the Reverend Theodore M. Hesburgh, CSC. Educated at Notre Dame and the Gregorian University in Rome, Hesburgh, or Father Ted, was ordained a priest of the Congregation of Holy Cross in Sacred Heart Church here on campus in 1943. In June 1952, at the ripe age of 35, he was named the 15th president of Notre Dame and served in that capacity for 35 years until 1987. Father Ted built the modern Notre Dame, overseeing not only the rise to prominence of the university in the ranks of American higher education, but also the transfer of university governance from the founding religious community, the Congregation of Holy Cross, to a predominantly lay board of trustees in 1967 and the admission of women to the university in 1972. A profound commitment to peace and justice and to exploring the ethical dimensions of public policy characterized Father Ted's career and inspired his goal of establishing a global center for studying and practicing peace. Father Ted achieved a good many of his goals. The Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies was established in 1986, thanks to the generosity of his friend, Mrs. Joan B. Kroc, who shared Father Ted's vision of educating and training peace builders from around the world who would come to Notre Dame be educated in the field of peace studies, return to their homes to work on advancing peace and justice through public policy and activism, and form a strong global network of peace builders. St. Thomas Aquinas's dictum, peace is the work of justice, continues to guide the Institute's research, teaching, practice, and outreach. This lecture series which honors Father Hesburgh, follows his example of open-ended inquiry that takes values seriously and cherishes wisdom. Recent speakers include Michael Walzer, Kenneth Roth, Anthony Lake, Mary Caldor, Shashi Tharoor, Shireen Ibadi, Amartya Sen, Amitav Ghosh, Cornell West, and Angela Davis. To this distinguished roster, we now add the Honorable Juan Manuel Santos. The president of Colombia from 2010 to 2018, this courageous and visionary statesman led his country through an arduous peace process, the first phase of which culminated in the signing of the historic Colombian peace agreement on November 24th, 2016. This accord is celebrated around the world as a major turning point in ending the country's 52-year armed conflict. In 2016, President Santos was the sole recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize for his pivotal role in ending the longest war in the Western Hemisphere. His speech to the Nobel Committee in Oslo City Hall on December 10th of that year delivered only two weeks after the, after the final agreement was signed and one week after the Colombian Congress overwhelmingly ratified it was eloquent and wise. The text of the speech reads in part like one of the typically rich discussions held by the students and faculty in Kroc Institute Peace Studies courses. For example, President Santos explained to his audience that building peach, peace is much harder than making war, and that it takes a great deal of patience, the stamina to suffer multiple setbacks along the way, 
and a readiness to settle in for the long haul. In 1982, 34 years ago, the efforts to find peace through dialogue began in Colombia, he reminded his distinguished audience. He also underscored on that day the foolishness of believing that the end of any conflict must be the elimination of the enemy. Quote, a final victory through force when nonviolent alternatives exist is none other than the defeat of the human spirit, he said. He urged instead, quote, dialogue based on respect for the dignity of all. He accepted this prize, quote, above all on behalf of the victims, the more than 8 million victims and displaced people whose lives have been devastated by the armed conflict, and the more than 220,000 women, men, and children who, to our shame, have been killed in this war. Indeed, the Colombian peace process is distinctive and perhaps unique in that it placed the victims and their rights at the center of the solution. Quote, that is the great paradox, President Santos said in his Nobel speech. That is the great paradox I have found, that while many who have not suffered the conflict in their own flesh are reluctant to accept peace, the victims are the ones who are most willing to forgive, to reconcile, and to face the future with a heart free of hate. I commend this speech to all of you, and I expect that President Santos in his lecture this afternoon will bring vividly to life for us many of the points he made then. Yet I wish to highlight one additional theme of the speech. Quote, you must properly prepare yourself for peacemaking, he said, and seek advice, studying the failures of peace attempts in your own country and learning from other peace processes, their successes and their problems, close quote. A worldwide expert in peace processes himself, President Santos took his own advice when he structured the peace process in Colombia by reaching out to acknowledged experts in this area of research and practice. Which leads me to this sentence that for some reason is the favorite line in the speech of people on this campus, I quote. The Crocs Institute for International Peace Studies at the University of Notre Dame in the United States has concluded, based on careful studies of the 34 agreements signed in the world to end armed conflicts in the past three decades, that this peace agreement in Colombia is the most complete and comprehensive ever reached, close quote. Here at Notre Dame, we are indeed proud and humbled that the agreement gives the University of Notre Dame's Kroc Institute the primary responsibility for technical verification and monitoring of implementation of the accord through the Kroc Institute's Peace Accord Matrix Barometer Initiative. As you might expect, President Santos has also received many other prizes and accolades, including the Lamp of Peace from the Sacred Convent of Assisi in Italy, which honors those working to promote peace and harmony, and the Tipperary International Peace Award in Ireland for his efforts to bring peace to his country and the region, for his pioneering environmental policies to protect Colombians' biodiversity and fight climate change. He was awarded the Royal Botanic Gardens Q International Medal and the Wildlife Conservation Society Theodore Roosevelt Award for Conservation Leadership. In addition, the National Geographic Society honored him for his unwavering commitment to conservation. Before serving as president of Colombia, Santos served as Minister of Foreign Trade and was elected to the Colombian Congress as the presidential designate, which is similar to the role of the vice president in this country. He also served as Minister of Finance and Minister of, Def of Defense. Prior to serving in government roles, he was a deputy publisher and journalist with the Colombian publication El Tiempo. He won the King of Spain Prize for Journalism 
for a series of articles looking at corruption within the Sandinista revolution in Nicaragua. This role as a journalist, President Santos told us last night, has informed his work as a statesman and a peacemaker. President Santos is a graduate of the Naval Academy in Cartagena. He holds a business and economics degree from the University of Kansas and also conducted postgraduate studies at the London School of Economics, the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University, and is a Fulbright Fellow at Harvard Uni University. Most impressively, he is a Distinguished Policy Fellow at Notre Dame's Keogh School of Global Affairs. <laughs> President Santos will now deliver the 29th Annual Hesburgh Lecture, Changing the Means but Not the Ends. Please join me in welcoming this remarkable world leader. Good afternoon. Before I start, uh, I want to tell you a sh short uh, story. Uh, this morning, I went to see Father Jenkins, and I told him uh, how sorry I was with the result of the football uh, <laughs> game uh, last weekend. Uh, I said, well, adversity uh, strengthens the character, so don't worry. But I will tell you uh, something that might encourage you for next Saturday. When I was at the University of Kansas, uh, 1970, by coincidence, I was invited to the Super Bowl. And that was the first time that the Kansas City Chiefs won the Super Bowl. Fifty years later, two years ago, I was in Miami and I was invited to the Super Bowl, and the Kansas City Chiefs won again for the second time. So they told me, you must continue to come because you bring us good luck. So I hope, and I will be there cheering for you, that next Saturday you will win. <laughs> Dean uh, Appleby, Thank you very much for such a generous presentation. Um, I want to also distinguish uh, Erin Corcoran, the acting director of the Kroc Institute, and Josefina Alvarez, my compatriot. She is the director of the Peace Accords Matrix. And I want to thank uh, the Kroc Institute and the University of Notre Dame because the work that the Kroc Institute has done with the peace process is unprecedented and has been extremely, extremely important uh, for the Colombians to keep building peace. And dear students, faculty, and friends, it is an honor, a great honor to be here at the University of Notre Dame. I've had a wonderful time so far teaching, but especially learning from the students. This is a lecture about ethics and public policy. Ethics have to do with values and principles, which I compare um, with maps and compasses that you use to re-encounter your way when you get lost. But first, you have to know where you want to go and how to get there. As a young man, I was a cadet in my country's Naval Academy. The first valuable lesson was to learn how to sail. This uh, lesson was uh, captured perfectly by the Roman philosopher Seneca, when he said, when you don't know what port you are steering towards, no wind will be favorable. 
I am inclined to a more positive interpretation. When we do know which port we are steering towards, even the most contrary winds can help us reach it. What should the port of destination of every leader be? One would think to be successful. But successful how? I would like to share with you what I believe to be the most beautiful definition of success by this great uh, American writer, Ralph Waldo Emerson. What is success? To laugh often and much. To win the respect of intelligent people and the affection of children. To earn the appreciation of honest critics and endure the betrayal of false friends. To appreciate beauty. To find the best in others, to leave the world a bit better, whether by a healthy child, a garden patch, or a redeemed social condition. To know even one life, one life has breathed easier because you have lived. This is to have succeeded. I have been trying to achieve this kind of success during my whole life. It hasn't been easy. It's never easy. You will always find unexpected obstacles, and you must be willing to change your course, change your views, without sacrificing your values nor your principles. Many times, Things don't go according to your plans. So you need to be open-minded and learn to adapt to the changing conditions. In the military jargon, you might say you should be prepared to change your tactics, but not your strategy, not your objectives. Learning from history from the experience of others and from my own experience, I myself have changed on many occasions, and I want to share with you three examples. I went from being a hawk to being a dove in the search for peace. To create the necessary conditions to have a successful peace process I had to make war, effective war, to tilt the military balance of power. Another condition was to convince the commanders of the FARC that for them, personally, the FARC was the oldest and strongest guerrilla in the Western Hemisphere, that for them, personally, it would be better to negotiate peace than to continue the war. In other words, I had to go after them with a big stick on the one hand and with a very attractive carrot on the other. In the previous 40 years, not one of the members of the leadership of the FARC had been captured or killed. I was able to do this uh, ger generating these two conditions among many things by changing completely our intelligence uh, with the gracious help of the CIA, the British intelligence, MI6, and the Israeli intelligence, the Mossad. So I had to make war in order to be able to make peace. And I was elected president the first time because I was a war hero. I had been Minister of Defense, a very effective Minister of Defense, so 
people um, elected me as a war hero. And when I was elected, uh, I started to uh, mentioned the word peace. And many people said, no, 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 don't do that. All your predecessors have failed. You are very popular, 86% favorability. You can continue, and you will end very popular. But this very wise man, a former Minister of Foreign Affairs of Israel, Shlomo Ben-Ami, good friend, said to me, I know, because I, we've worked together, that in the end you want peace. And uh, think about this. When you are ending your life, I hope many years from now, you look back and you can continue being very popular and you continue the war. But you look back and uh, you start thinking, how many lives could I, could I have saved if I had made peace? And you will not go to the grave with a clear conscience. Think about that. And that was a very powerful argument. So I took the risk. And he warned me, because you were elected as a war hero and you sit down with your adversaries, they will call you a traitor, as every peacemaker has been called. And that happened. You will, you will lose your political capital. And that happened. However, we were able to make an agreement with the FARC. And here is another lesson about leadership. I was a leader in times of war. And I was a leader making peace. As the dean just said, I mentioned that making war is much easier than making peace. But why do I say this? Because leading in war is this type of leadership that is very vertical. You give orders, you rally the people around you, and you charge against your adversaries. And as long as you win, you're in good shape. Leading in times of peace to make peace, it's a completely different type of leadership. It's horizontal. Instead of giving orders, you have to persuade. You have to convince uh, the people who have suffered to forgive the perpetrators. And that is much more difficult. And uh, leading from war to peace, also you need to legitimize what you're, what you're doing, even in times of war. And we did that. I made a tremendous effort to treat my former enemies, my adversaries, as human beings. And I, I was uh, taught that by a, a general of the Colombian army who had retired. He was a good friend of my father. And when I was minister, I appointed minister of defense, he said, I know that you want peace, but you have to be successful in making war to bring them to the negotiating table. But you have to be successful in a very special way. Treat the FARC as human beings. And don't call them your enemies. Call them your adversaries. And I asked, what's the difference? And he said, there's a great difference. Enemies, you eliminate. Adversaries, you beat. But you are going to have to live with them for the rest of your lives. So earn their respect and, and protect their, their human rights. And so I told my soldiers, uh, start protecting the human rights instead of the body count doctrine that we inherited from Vietnam, start stimulating the demobilization. And only when it's necessary, you kill them. Better to be having captured also. And that gave the moral high ground 
to our army, to our armed forces, and that was more powerful. The commanders after, afterwards said to me, the commanders of the guerrillas, that was much more powerful than the planes bombing our camps. So that was a very important lesson of how you change from one vision to the other with the same objectives. Something similar happened with the environment, with my attitude towards the environment. In the fight against climate change, I went uh, from being indifferent, which is almost equivalent to being a denier, to being a passionate, which I am right now, advocate of the environmentalist cause. Today, I truly believe that there is nothing more important in the world agenda than fighting climate change if we want to survive. And I wish uh, this is a message that everybody, hopefully sooner than later, understands, accepts, and, take, and takes action. And how did this change come about? Our indigenous communities in Colombia are the oldest of all the Americas, especially the ones that are in the north of Colombia, in a beautiful place called the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta. They are the ones who keep uh, the pre-Hispanic culture best. Uh, they're still very, very uh, traditional in every respect. Well, I got to know them. Uh, I started learning from them. And uh, when I became president, I went to recognize them as our older brothers. So I flew in the presidential plane to the nearest city and I took a helicopter up in the mountain and went and asked their governors, their what they call the mamos, the leaders, for their permission to go to Congress and be sworn in. They were very impressed by this gesture of recognition and they said, okay, we will give you our blessing, and we'll give you a mandate. I know that you want to make peace with the FARC, but also make peace with nature. Because if you don't make peace with nature, it doesn't make any difference if you make peace with the FARC or not, because we will all perish. And they said, unfortunately, you're going to suffer a retaliation from Mother Nature because she had been hurt. And uh, I didn't quite understand what they were saying. I went back. And a week after, the worst Nina phenomenon hit Colombia, the worst ever. I had to administer a flooded country for more than a year. And I had no idea of what to do, how to do it. So I brought in experts from around the world, among them former Vice President Al Gore. And uh, I took him to the presidential palace and for a whole day, he gave me a marvelous lesson about what climate change was, how important it is to fight global warming, and he gave me advice on how to do it. So there, I started to study and uh, realize how important our biodiversity was, how important the protection of the environment, and I became uh, very passionate about protecting our biodiversity. Colombia is the richest country in the planet in terms of biodiversity per square kilometer. Um, we are one of the most important sources of water. We have more rivers than the United States or than India in Colombia, which is quite much smaller. But especially the concentration of our biodiversity is tremendous. So I changed my way of 
viewing the environment from being a denier or indifferent to being absolutely convinced uh, that uh, if we don't protect our environment, if we don't make peace with Mother Nature, as these indigenous uh, communities told me, we will all perish. A third experience that I had has to do with the war on drugs. As you know, Colombia um, has been the country that has suffered the most in the war on drugs that was declared by the world in the United Nations back in 1961. And uh, um, I, as Minister of Defense, uh, and even before, when I was a journalist, I was convinced that uh, a hard line stands against uh, the whole chain of drug trafficking and uh, prohibition was the way to approach this terrible problem. Colombia has been the country that has made the biggest sacrifices. We have lost our best leaders, our best journalists, our best judges, our best policemen. And when I was uh, in the Ministry of Defense, I made the war against drugs in my country a priority. So I had to spray uh, the largest amount of hectares of coca plants in the history of Colombia and in the history of the world. I had my police and soldiers eradicate forcefully more hectares of coca plantations than any other person in Colombia or in the world. We uh, caught more uh, drugs going out of the country than ever before. I have been the person in the history of the United States that has extradited more drug traffickers to the United States than uh, any person in the world. 1,450 extraditions I signed. However, we are still the number one exporter of cocaine to world markets. Uh, the drug problem is still there. And so I start saying, my God, this cannot continue as it is. And when you start analyzing the war on drugs worldwide, you see that this has been a tremendous failure that what was envisaged in 1961, when President Nixon also declared the war on drugs in 1972, we are worse off today. In Colombia, in Latin America, in Africa, which is becoming a very big problem there in Africa, and everywhere in the world. So that's why I start changing, even when I was president, my views on uh, how to approach this problem. Uh, and uh, I have a, a anecdote which in a way encapsulates what uh, reality uh, is in this, in this war. It's, it was Winston Churchill during Prohibition here in the United States. He crossed the Canada in railroad and uh, landed in near in California, and Churchill uh, used to like uh, his uh, whiskeys once in a while, and he asked for whiskey. And they said, oh no, Mr. Churchill, this is prohibited here in the United States. And he said, oh, what a strange country this is. <laughs> These fabulous uh, profits that are made out of the sale of liquor, you give them to the mafias. In my country, we give them to the treasury. And that is what I now am convinced that is the only solution. We will not ever uh, be able to stop people consuming drugs. This is as old as history. But we can take the violence and the corruption and the money out of the mafias, uh, as was done 
here in the United States a hundred years ago when you did away with prohibition. Uh, these are three examples where I, I changed the means but not the ends. And uh, I will remember that every leader, and if you are students uh, of this great University of Notre Dame, you will be leaders. Every leader should have what every religion, um, among them my, my religion, which is probably yours, uh, the, at least the majority in this university, Catholic religion, so strongly exalts compassion. Or, as Emerson said, to make a difference in improving the life of others. We are currently in great demand of good and effective leadership. We are facing a world with a democracy on the defensive and populism on the rise. A weakened multilateral system where a pandemic that has not finished yet that greatly increased poverty and inequality around the world. Multiple armed and political conflicts, the terrifying possibility of nuclear war, and of course, the existential threat of climate change. And on top of that, and after decades of peace in Europe, we are now witnessing the horrors of war in Ukraine will, with all its dire consequences. But don't get discouraged. History has taught us again and again that even in the midst of darkness, in the midst of fear, uncertainty, and suffering, there is always a light to turn on, a light that allows us to see a better future. All these problems can be solved. My message to the students of Notre Dame as future leaders is that you, all of you, in your different spheres of actions can make possible the impossible. Remember the words of one of your founding fathers, Thomas Jefferson. Nothing, nothing can stop a person with the right mental attitude from achieving his goal. And to be able to do that in today's world, I challenge you to lead with hope, not fear to build bridges instead of walls, to foster solidarity and respect for diversity, to say humanity first, not my country first, my religion first, or my race first, to lead with empathy, not apathy, to seek opportunities in every difficulty, to embrace change, to be optimistic in a world flooded with pessimism. If you lead with a compassionate heart and a positive mind and with the truth, you will make the world a better place. So today, I urge you to be successful in making a difference, in creating a more inclusive, tolerant, loving world, even if that means changing your course or swimming against the current. And let it be said about you that one life has breathed easier because you 
have lived. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. President, for your speech. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Josefina Chavarria, and I'm the director of the Peace Accords Matrix at the Kroc Institute, Kiev School of Global Affairs. It is a real pleasure to welcome you today to the DPAC and, of course, each and every one of you. Um, we wanted to use this space to give the students uh, an opportunity to ask you some questions. So I would ask uh, the students to come forward and share with us some of the some of your inquiries for President Santos. If you would remind us of your name and uh, what you're studying, that would be great. Thank you. Just we need to turn on the mic. Sorry. <laughs> Mr. President, thank you for sharing your walk through life and your experiences with us. My name is Grani Malone, and I'm from County Offaly in Ireland. I'm a sophomore majoring in anthropology and peace studies. And my question is, what does a world coursing with peace look like in your eyes, and how can we cultivate that world? Thank you, Grani. Right now, peace in the world, you, you mean... Um, I hope that the pandemic has taught us all that we have one planet and that we all live in the same house and that we need to cooperate uh, with each other in order to survive. Cooperation means dialogue, means understanding the people who think different from you. And uh, it means also something which is very urgent right now, is to reverse the trend mm. of weakening the multilateral system. The multilateral system, the rule of law at, at a global level is necessary to avoid conflict, to avoid wars, and to cooperate, for example, to fight a, a pandemic or to fight climate change. So I truly believe that uh, fostering uh, dialogue and cooperation among nations uh, is a necessary, very necessary conditions to have peace in the world. Thank you very much. Yes. I think we have more questions. Please. Hello, President. Oh, is it on? There you go. Hello, President Santos. Thank you for coming and speaking with us and being a real leader in um, peace processes across the world. So thank you. Um, we've been reading your book in our Policy Lab class, and one thing that really stood out to me was how you brought together different factions of this conflict. So. State, par, uh, state representatives, paramilitary members, guerrilla leaders. How do you even approach and begin a conversation to encourage them to come to the table for these negotiations? What's that process like? And in your experience, what were the successes and what were some of the failures? Thank you. Well, th there's an in interesting story about this issue of how you bring people together that are, that are by very different at war, killing each other. I had the opportunity to meet uh, Nelson Mandela. Uh, I was the chair of something called the United Nations Conference of Trade and Development. And uh, he was elected chair. I was the eighth conference, and he was elected chair of the ninth conference. I, I had to go to Johannesburg to give him the chair, I 
put on the South African television and I saw something very surreal. In live television, the victims and the, vict and the perpetrators were getting together for the first time. Some of them uh, hit each other, screamed at each other, others embraced, others knelt down and started praying. It was really surreal. And I asked Mandela that afternoon, what is this? And uh, a conversation that uh, was programmed to last uh, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, lasted four and a half hours. He explained to me the importance of the victims in the reconciliation, but the importance of bringing together the people in order to, uh, to talk. He has a phrase, which is a marvelous phrase. The best weapon you have is to sit down and talk. And that's what I did with the FARC. Sit down and talk, and, they, and we finished the war. Great weapon. Very effective. Now, how did he do that? He said, there was a Canadian from, from Shell, the Shell Oil Company, who has a methodology called scenario planning. I used him, uh, he, and he was quite effective. So I started searching for this Canadian. His name is Adam Kahani, mm -hmm. and I finally uh, found him. He was advising the Northern Ireland peace process. He was advising the Canadians on the Montreal separatism. And I said, can you come to Colombia um, and show us what you what you do in this scenario planning. And I said, well, I'm very busy, but if I have the chance, I will, I will do that. I will go to Colombia. And suddenly he called me a couple of months later and he said, I am going to Brazil and I can go to Colombia in about uh, three weeks. Can you bring together as, as many people that are in conflict as possible? And I will explain to you what this exercise is all about. So I start uh, talking to uh, the guerrillas, the paramilitaries, uh, sending messages. Would you like? We, we, I invite you to to a, to a, uh, a meeting to hear somebody that might uh, encourage us to have peace. And I was surprised. Uh, with the uh, affirmative response that I got from everybody, from the guerrillas, the, the two guerrilla groups, the paramilitaries. At that time, we were very polarized, as you are here in the United States, uh, and as we are also between uh, parties, the Republicans, Democrats. There we had the liberals and the conservatives. Um, but I, br I brought in all the actors of different conflicts. And we were in a round table and this Alam Kahani came in and said and asked everybody to identify themselves. Some of them were through a telephone because they couldn't be present because they would be captured. They had uh, order, orders to be arrested. But at the end of this uh, presentation he said, I am very encouraged here. I mean, I cannot be more encouraged. What you did in three weeks, it took 15 years in South Africa. And it's simply an exercise where the parties discuss possible scenarios. Uh, what happens if we do this? What happens if we do that? And what would be the, the development of different four scenarios? And that started... Uh, an exercise that he uh, conducted uh, which allowed the different parties to start talking to each other, the dialogue. And that was what the basis for the peace process. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I think that's also a great idea for our pedagogies in class. Yes, please.
You you speak up the I think so. Sarah, is it right? A <laughs> cappella. <laughs> 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 So from your experience, what advice would you give to other nations in conflict for ensuring minority inclusion in peacemaking efforts? Uh, the, the question is, uh, what advice can I give to include the minorities in the peace processes and peace efforts? Well, I'll give you a, an example of what I did exactly three weeks ago. I was with uh, President Zelensky in Kiev, in Ukraine. He invited me uh, to share my experiences and discuss um, the situation there, which is quite uh, dramatic. Mm. And uh, among the things I told him is, I've learned to the importance of visualizing the victims, of giving the victims importance. Um, if you start, and we did this in Colombia, we, we approved a law uh, recognizing the victims, visualizing them, even before we negotiated peace. So we started before, because we had so many victims, we have more than 9 million victims, that it will take a long time. Uh, well, among the victims, there are some victims that are more victims than the other victims usually the minorities, ethnic uh, the, uh, women, women are, they suffer more in wars. Uh, so by visualizing the victims, and I told Zelensky, this will give you the, hor the moral high ground. You will be able to claim afterwards more reparations in the name of the victims if you want to take uh, the Russians to a tribunal, uh, international tribunal, you will have more authority if you do it in the name of the victims. So visualizing the victims, but especially the weakest links of the chain of victims, will give the whole process more legitimacy. That's what, what, what I did. we did in Colombia, and that would be what I would advise anybody who wants to uh, make peace, uh, take into account the victims and take into account the weakest sectors of society that were victimized. That will uh, generate uh, uh, empathy mm -hmm. and will give you uh, the authority and the legitimacy to construct a durable peace. Thank you very much. I think we have more questions from our students. Thank you. Uh, hi. Yes. <clears throat> hi, President Santos. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Um, my name is Dane Sherman, and I am a junior at the University of Notre Dame studying American Studies, Peace Studies, and minoring in Gender Studies. Um, I'm from Seattle, Washington, but I'm loving the Midwest, as I hope you are. Um, my question is, um, while religious disaffiliation is on the rise in the United States and a lot of parts of Europe, in many parts of the world, especially in like South America and other parts of the global South, religious affiliation is rising um, and becoming an even more ingrained part of people's lives. Um, as someone from a majority Catholic country, um, and someone who said you're Catholic yourself, 
Um, what role have religious actors played in peace processes? Um, and what do you see as the role of religious institutions working for peace more broadly? Nice cup. <laughs> I'm going to wear one uh, on Saturday. Um, the religious uh, communities, in the case of Colombia, we, um, we have a very strong Catholic Church uh, in Colombia, but we also have evangelical uh, uh, churches that are on the rise. But almost every religion has peace as one of their main objectives. The Islam, Confucius, uh, you, whatever you, religion you study, peace is the main objective. And uh, I must say that uh, uh, the uh, churches and the Catholic Church has played a very important role in generating trust among the different parties of a conflict and bringing together. There's a special uh, bond between the people with the church in certain matters, and they have been able to develop uh, an, a special moral authority to lead uh, discussions and, and convoke the different parties. And um, they have played a, a determinant role. I had a, a a bad experience with the church for the following reason. There's something which is happening in the U.S. and uh, around the world called fake news. And the social media are fake news. Well, when I was in the peace process and uh, I had promised to put the peace process to a referendum. The armies of these robots of the social media with the fake news started massive attacks on the peace process, saying all kinds of, of terrible things. They were so obnoxious that I said to myself, ah, nobody would believe that. Well, I was mistaken. I underestimated the power of fake news and the strategy to, to uh, change the mentality of many people. Among those fake news was the gender chapter that was included in the, in the peace process. Somebody, the attorney general of the state, who was not a very good friend of the peace process, said, that peace process has hidden in the gender chapter something called ideology of gender. I didn't even know what that was. I was then explained that this is the theory whereby you are not born either a man or a male or female, that you, are, uh, you become a, a male or female as time passes. Well, of course, Every religion says this is a no-no. And he said, this will destroy the Colombian families. And uh, uh, I did not believe that every people will, would believe that. Well, many of the priests and many of the bishops believe that. And a week before the referendum, it came to me, all the, bishop, all the priests around the, the country are, are advising uh, the people to vote no. And we made a poll. We lost the referendum by a small margin. We made a poll after why did the no vote, uh, why did they vote no? 35% of the people who voted no, and we lost the referendum by less than 1%, but 35% had voted no because of this issue of ideology of the agenda. Well, when I, when I uh, started the renegotiation, because we had to renegotiate the, the agreement in order to have it approved, I brought in the leaders of the no vote. And among them, I brought in 
the heads of the different churches, especially the Catholic Church. The, the cardinal was there. His name was Cardinal Salazar. You probably know him. Various bishops and some of the evangelical pastors. And I took my pen, the same pen, the same pen. I said, listen, change whatever you want in the agreement that will satisfy you uh, with all the concerns that all your priests have been uh, exposing in the churches uh, about the peace process. And they said, uh, Mr. President, uh, no, save your pen. We are here to say we are very sorry. We believed the Attorney General, because he's the Attorney General. And you're right, there's nothing in this agreement that, that uh, is related to this ideology of gender. And when the Pope went to Colombia, the Pope supported the, the peace process uh, with enthusiasm since the beginning. I went uh, about three or four times to the Vatican to see if he could go to Colombia to, to give me some, uh, to help me. And I said, Holy Father, go to Colombia. And he, he always looked at me and said, uh, don't, President, you must persevere. And don't worry, I pray almost every day for you. <laughs> and I said, my God, if you have to pray every day for me, I'm in big trouble. <laughs> um, and he said, no, wait. You, you, I will go when you and the Colombian people will most need me. And he decided to go to Colombia on a historic visit after we had signed the peace process, after the guerrillas had given up their arms and they were given to the United Nations. And he himself uh, chose the title of his visit. I go to Colombia to push the Colombians in the very difficult path of reconciliation. He knew very well that in a peace process you have peacemaking, which is the negotiation, signing, what they call DDR, disarmament, demobilization, reintegration. That we had finished, but the difficult phase of a peace process is peace building, constructing peace. I say this is like constructing a cathedral, brick by brick with a lot of patience, and it might take generations. But the point is that the Pope went, summoned the bishops, and scolded them. How can you go against the peace process without reading the agreement? Mm -hmm. And uh, then they said we were rightly scolded. Uh, but that is to tell you, it's just a parenthesis. I must say, I must uh, also thank that the church has always been pro-peace, uh, a engine for peace, and uh, they have the authority and uh, the means to be very valuable. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you. Uh, I think that those are very important words when we think about all the work that we still have to do many years later, not only as monitors, but as, as uh, peace scholars and, and peace builders. I think we have more questions uh, from our students. Yes? Uh, good afternoon. Uh, can you hear me? Not yeah. really. <laughs> you want to come a little bit closer? Okay. Hello? Yeah. No. yeah. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Adila Ferdos. I come from Indian Administer, Kashmir. I'm a first year Master's of Global Affairs student, and I'm concentrating in international peace studies. So I actually have a couple of questions. Um, um, my first question is, how do you weave the impact of the peace accord in Colombia today? And what are the implementations of the peace accords and their impact on the ground? Which is second? Uh, Can you repeat that? The... Oh, what are the implementations of the peace accord and their impact on the ground today in Colombia? And also from your perspective, how can the status quo of conflict be changed? And what are the ways in which actors, parties, 
of the armed conflict can be brought to the negoti negotiation table. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. The, the implementation of the peace process, I must again commend uh, the, this university and uh, the Kroc Institute. Um, this peace process is unique in many, re many ways, but one of the very unique things was first, the first time ever that two parties at war get together to create a special tribunal, special justice, transitional justice system, and agree to be judged by this tribunal. That had never happened before. And it had never happened before that the two parties got together and said, we need somebody to verify the implementation of the peace process. This has been a problem of almost every peace process. And uh, I was asking Josefina yesterday because I, how was it that the Kroc Institute uh, landed in the middle of the negotiation mm -hmm. uh, as the institution that both parties accepted to verify the implementation of the agreement. And she said to me, well, uh, many of, of our people had uh, been uh, talking to the different parties and creating something is, which is absolutely essential in any peace process, trust. Mm -hmm. And that when uh, this discussion came and the Krog Institute, there was almost no discussions from either the FARC or the government. So this is uh, the institution we want to be the one that sort of supervise the implementation. And we were not wrong. I think the Krog Institute had made a tremendous work on supervising, on pointing where we are going, where we are not going, what has happened. Uh, the peace, this peace process was very, very successful in many ways in the terms of, of the speed with which things have been uh, implemented. For example, this first phase of the DDR. Uh, the amount, uh, the, the time that it took from negotiations to disarmament was very short. The number of weapons per guerrilla, highest in the, in the history. Uh, the reintegration process, usually in this peace process, between 12 and 15 percent of the people in arms will not submit. In this case, it was 96 percent. So four, only 4 percent did not submit. And we still today have 94, 95 percent of the guerrillas that, that submitted to the, to the peace process, to the agreement, accounted for where they are, what, uh, um, what they're doing. We have a problem that uh, many of them have been killed. Uh, retaliations, uh, uh, revenge, uh, or uh, different reasons. That is something that is worrisome. Um, there's other aspects of the peace process because it's a peace process that was very ambitious. It didn't want only to finish the war, but finish the causes of the war, the causes of the conflict. So that's why this agreement is such so ambitious, uh, and there's some reforms that unfortunately in the last four years we had a hostile government, uh, hostile to the peace process. It had campaigned against the peace process. It was not able to derail the peace process because of the international community, because of popular uh, support for the peace process. Uh, because after the referendum, the people started to realize that they made a mistake. In the last elections, uh, 75, almost 80 percent of the people were in favor of the implementation of the peace process. Mm -hmm. So things are going in the right direction. Uh, we have 15 years because it's so ambitious. Um, 
according to the Krog Institute, we have already achieved about 35% of, of the more than how many points in the 500 and something points. We have already complied with 35%. We still have a long way to go. I hope that this new government recently elected, it's been one month in office, it was elected among other things because they promised to implement and accelerate the implementation of the peace agreement. Yes, Mr. President, definitely we're and thank also you. keeping And thank eye. you again for the, for the, to the Kroc Institute because you've done a marvelous job. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we still have uh, 10 more minutes if there are some more questions. Yes, uh, I think we have one here, and then we can go to you. Is that okay? Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Tess Osborne. I'm a first-year Masters of Global Affairs student with a concentration in international peace. And my question is, how has your upbringing influenced the way in which you engage with politics? Thank you. How do what? Your upbringing. The uh, way you were upbringing. brought up. Yeah. <laughs> oh, <laughs> My upbringing, um, I, I come from a, from a very traditional family in Colombia. We were owners of the uh, largest, uh, most important newspaper for 100 years. Uh, we, the family sold the newspaper, uh, fortunately, at the time when the price was highest. <laughs> Uh, because new, the newspaper business has gone down tremendously in the last uh, eight, nine years. Um, I, I remember Colombia has been a very violent country for, for really a very long time. I remember when I, I was small going to the, the farms of, of uh, my uncles uh, and uh, we had to go with the army because of insecurity. Uh, there was called the, the violencia. Mm -hmm. uh, it was like a semi-civil war between liberals and conservatives. Um, but when I really uh, felt uh, the need to search for peace was when I, I went uh, to the Navy then I, I went abroad, I lived in London, came back as a journalist. And that was when uh, the drug cartels, you remember Pablo Escobar and all the uh, big drug cartels were present, but also the paramilitaries, but also the guerrillas. And uh, I started seeing how the Colombian people were losing the uh, ability to feel compassion. And I saw it in my newspaper where I worked. Um, if the massacre did not, if, if there was a massacre of less than 15 people, it would not, would not make front page. And I said, this is, this is a, uh, absurd. I mean, what is happening to us? Then I, I went into public office, I became minister, first minister of foreign trade. Uh, one of my first, uh, uh, visits was to New York uh, to a seminar where we were going to we were opening the economy we wanted investment and uh, there was a big meeting with many many CEOs and in the middle of I was uh, with the Minister of Finance in the middle of the conference a news about a big bomb in a commercial center in Bogota came of course the conference failed and the CEO of a very important uh, American company uh, came to me and said, listen, your plan is perfect. Your country is beautiful and it has a great, great potential. But until you finish the war, you will not be able to attract investment. Uh, capital is always very nervous when there is violence and war. And so all these things uh, convinced me that uh, my port of destination was to seek peace. And that 
I made that as my sort of priority and commitment. Maybe that's part of the upbringing that led me to to uh, do what I did. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Yes, please. I think, yes. Can you ask your question? Yes, I'm sorry, there's a light in my eyes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President, for sharing the great lessons and, and for inspiring tolerance and hope. Uh, I'm Zakira Rasuli from Afghanistan. I am mastering in, uh, master in global affairs and concentrating in peace studies. Uh, my question for you um, concerns the gendered nature of peace and war um, and considering how women disproportionately suffer from war. What was the role of women in resolving the armed conflict in Colombia? And did women have a meaningful um, participation and agency in, during the peace um, negotiation? Also in transitional just, uh, sorry, in the um, yeah, transitional justice process afterwards. And what efforts were made to ensure their meaningful participation? Thank you. What efforts were made? How, how did you ensure? that the participation women. from women were meaning, was meaningful in the, in the peace process, but also yeah. I think that in peace building in general. Thank you. Um, that is, uh, this is the, the Colombian Peace Agreement is the first and only agreement that has a gender chapter. Mm. Um, as I was explaining before about the importance of visualizing the victims and attending their concerns as a way to legitimize the process. This is also probably the first peace agreement that has a, a, a human rights approach. As a matter of fact, in one of the very difficult points of the agenda with the FARC, which is the justice, uh, the, the victims have four rights established in the Rome Statute. Mm -hmm. The rights to justice, the right to justice, the right to reparations, the right to the truth, and the right to non-repetition. We made the rights of the victims the heart of the negotiation. Uh, uh, the whole negotiation was made around those rights. The justice part was very difficult. And at the same time, every peace process boils down to one decision. Where do you draw the line between peace and justice? My instructions to my negotiators was seek as much peace, as much justice that will allow us peace. And no matter where you draw the line, you will always have criticism from one side who seeks more justice or from another side who seeks more peace. That's the ingratitude of hmm. peacemakers. Um, and uh, the victims so were uh, the heart of the negotiations and I, as I said, visualizing them uh, and visualizing the victims who have been more victims. Um, women suffer more. Women are more victims than the average victim. Uh, even though it's very difficult um, discussion, we were discussing this in, uh, this morning, uh, when you start comparing uh, who suffers more. Everybody suffers in a war. And that's why it's better to not make war or to end wars. Uh, but anyway, the, 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 the women should be visualized and should be, in a way, repaired more. And so we included a gender chapter. They went to, the, to Cuba, to Havana, during the negotiations to express their concerns, express their desire to be taken into account. And that's how the gender chapter was 
included. And they have, a, in a way, sort of an affirmative action in the reparation process, in the implementation of the process. Um, and uh, I think that uh, this is a good example. Um, it's, always, it's always easier to find peace among women, you know, among men. This is something that is, is becoming as a norm. Uh, so to bring in the women in the negotiations will always add instead of subtract. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I think, are you a student here? Okay. I think we are having one more minute, please. on your own, um, it strikes me that there was nobody else represented from the other side, the guerrilleros, nadie fue representado en, ese, en esa ceremonia, cierto, del premio Nobel. Um, ¿Por qué fue eso? Um, especially because you mentioned um, Nelson Mandela as an example, right? Nelson Mandela received the Nobel Prize alongside the South Africaners, right, the white Africaners. Um, and my second question is about deforestation. Um, RCN um, had reported that this year there's been 50,000 hectares of, of, of forest land in Colombia and the Amazons in different regions um, that have been destroyed, um, right? So there's been an increase and so forth. Um, and they had a, a congresswoman on the show who said that that's connected to the peace process not being implemented, the first point of the peace process not being implemented. Um, so what would be your advice to the current administration to, to solve the process of deforestation, to combat that? Um, and number one is, um, why, why, why were you the only one to receive the Nobel Prize? Thank you. Well. Uh you have to address that question to the Nobel Committee. Uh, I, I, um, I, didn't, I had no, uh, uh, no say in, I, I didn't even know that they were gonna give me the Nobel Prize. I was woken up one day at four o'clock in the morning. Hey, you won the Nobel Prize. And I, that was my son. I said, I was asleep. I said, oh, thank you. And I hung up mm -hmm. and he was, uh, insisting, insisting, and finally he woke me up, and I realized. When I went to the to the uh, to Oslo to receive the Nobel, I took many victims with me, um, especially one who taught me a, a great lesson. Uh, that's why talking to the victims was so important. <clears throat> There was, there was uh, this professor of leadership when I was in Harvard. Uh, his name is Ronald Heifetz. He went to Colombia um, and he said to me, you're embarking in a very difficult uh, path, very difficult. <clears throat> um, you're going to be alone the solitude of power. <clears throat> uh, I advise you to talk to the victims. Um, sorry. <coughs> sorry. sorry. <coughs> to talk to the, vic to the victims um, to re-energize you. I had been very skeptic about the victims, <clears throat> precisely because they were victims. I thought they were going to be hard in accepting a peace process. Well, I started talking to the victims, and I realized that they were much more generous than the people in the cities that had not suffered the war. And they, they encouraged me to persevere. And I asked them, why are you so generous? And they said, because we don't want others to suffer what I suffered. That for me was a lesson in life. My vision of the human condition increased. <clears throat> but there was one victim, a special victim that I took to Oslo. And I said, you are the real recipient of this Nobel Prize. It was, her name is Pastora Mira. Mm. She comes from the coffee region in the center of the, of the, of the country. Her father was killed, her mother was killed, 
her brother was killed, and her son was tortured and killed. And a week after she buried her son that was tortured and killed, somebody came into her house, wounded, asking for help. And she opened her house, small hut, to this person. He put him in the, his son's room, in his son's bed, which he had buried a week before, cured him. And when he was going out, he saw a picture of this wonderful woman with her son. And he stared at the picture, knelt down, and started crying. And said, please don't tell me that is your son. And he says, yes, that is my son. Why? And he continued crying, kneeling down. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. I must tell you, I was the one who tortured and killed your son. And so she looked at him, told him to stand up. And he stood up. He looked in his eyes and embraced him and said, thank you. Thank you. And this guy was going crazy. Why are you thanking me? If I just told you I tortured and killed your son, he was sort of going crazy. And she said, because by what you did, recognizing and asking for forgiveness, you allow me not to hate for the rest of my life. That she and the victims, and that I said in the speech uh, when I received the Nobel Peace Prize, those are the real uh, people who deserve the Nobel Peace Prize. Of course, my counterpart, who uh, I now talk to him very frequently, the commander of the FARC. Uh, he, it would have been good that he uh, could be there also, because you make, it takes two to tangle. <laughs> but unfortunately, or uh, for him, uh, the Nobel Committee did not uh, uh, think that that was what should have happened. Um, but that's the reason. I mean, um, it's a decision of the Nobel Committee. Deforestation. Yes, the last, the, the government uh, during the last four years was, I would say, negligent in implementing the peace process. One of the uh, very important aspects of the peace process is to give in those areas where the conflict was concentrated, mm. uh, rural development and opportunities. And this has not been implemented. I hope it does from now on. And these coincide with areas where deforestation has uh, increased. Uh, the coca production has uh, expanded the frontier. And that's what I hope, that with the implementation of the peace process, you can reverse that. And, and, and the Kroc Institute, I hope you uh, sort of uh, verify that that happens. It is our <laughs> job. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Yes. So um, let's take a quick referendum. <laughs> How many of you think that the Nobel uh, Committee chose wisely in a Pointing uh, in awarding the Nobel Peace Prize to President Santos to represent his country. How many of you? <laughs> Sir, I think you can keep the prize. Please join me in thanking President Santos. Thank you also, Josefina, Thank you. for a remarkable presentation and interaction. Uh, he's a person I've learned of great generosity and spirit, and we are honored that he is in our presence this week and will also be in our DC office at some point soon. So please join me in thanking President Santos.